following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. We are back. The Graws Yankees. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And for the best Yankee podcast on the Internet, who do you count on, Jack DeGraw? How are you? Good. How are you today, Ralph? Oh, could not complain at all as we were talking off the air. Um, we both live in places where weather is generally not a concern. Um, we have our ups and downs. We have fires, earthquakes, petulance. But for the most part, the two parts of the country that have uh, avoided uh, certainly this winter chill has been Florida and California. I'm out in California. You're in Florida um, getting ready for some Yankee spring training um, in Tampa. Are you not? Well, yeah, Ralph, and the good thing is a lot of the guys, they're out on the field. They're out over the minor league complex, and, you know, they're taking grounders, and they're, you know, they're, they're hitting BP. And some Yankee news is Didi Gregorius has been down here, and Didi has taken some ground balls, and he's hitting off a tee one-handed. Okay. So uh, he had a ways to go with that shoulder. Yeah. But, but he is down here. And some more Yankee news. They were talking about Andujar at third. What they might do this year, they might have him play a couple steps back, you know, you know, to, because to, to make up for his reflexes. You know, he's got the excellent arm, so they might have him, uh, you know, instead of playing even with the grass, they might, you know, play him uh, 6 or 12 inches back. So we'll see. You know, that's something to look for. Two-headed sword, of course, because uh, that limits him in coming in for ground balls and, and what have you. Um, but nevertheless, uh, they also mentioned the possibility of him being a DH. Uh, I think that he's a very young uh, for them to give up on his defense that quickly. Well, yeah, I, I agree. I think one of the things, you know, you might see him, you know, move to first base if, you know, uh, you know, Bird and uh, Boyd don't come through this year. And, you know, he could even play the outfield because he's got an excellent arm. But one thing you don't want to do, you don't want to lose a bat like that. Yeah, speaking of bats that really disintegrated, and we've talked about this a little before, is there any explanation as to why Bird has gone into the tank as he has? You know, it, it's really hard to put your finger on. I mean, you know, he used to have excellent selection at the plate, and, you know, he'd hit the ball all over. I mean, one of the things is now maybe he's just trying to pull the ball too much because it seems like when he gets in the lineup, you know, he strikes out a lot, and he's just not hitting the ball with authority. So, I mean, uh, I don't know. I think this is, uh, you know, a, a make-or-break year for him. I don't think they'll stick with him too long. I mean, he's he's got time for the minor leagues, but I think by midseason, if he don't step it up, uh, you know, you, that might be the end of him in New York. Well, um, it, it's sad, too, because he might be one of those players that got – caught up on that power-hungry, um, lift-the-ball type type teaching. And um, can't blame him because that's what players go to the pay, uh, pay window with is power numbers anymore. And it doesn't matter strikeouts. It doesn't matter about beating the shift uh, um, on base percentage. Uh, it's just a matter of... of what they're looking for is tremendous home run numbers. And that's endemic to uh, all of baseball, not just the Yankees. Uh, what do you think about that? Am I somewhat on track? Oh, well, well, yeah, I mean, because I remember when Bird was in Tampa down here, I mean, he looked like a great hitter. And even another, you know, like in Trenton and Scranton, I mean, he was using the whole field. You know, he was going to left field. And, and now it just seems like, just like you were saying, all these guys string, swing from the ass and try to hit home runs. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's all or nothing. And it's, uh, you know, it, a lot of times it's not a fun game to watch. Uh, absolutely. 
guy I want to ask you about is the um, recuperating uh, Ellsbury. Is he uh, establishing some sort of a market value? Well, I, I think it, the, the thing is, you know, he'll get his shot in uh, spring training, you know, to see if he's healthy. And the thing with Ellsbury in New York, I mean, he's been a big disappointment with the contract. But to be fair to him, I mean, when the Yankees got him, I was excited because he was a great player in Boston. And, to you know, to give him, you know, his due, his first year he was all right, and then the last two or three years, he didn't play at all last year, he was mediocre. So the thing is, he hasn't been terrible. He's just been average. And I think if he shows anything in spring training, I mean, some teams will be interested. And, you know, who knows, maybe he could even help the Yankees. He might, uh, I was thinking over the over the past few months, might even be able to help the Mets. Um, just thought they might want to dump a contract and uh, maybe help the Mets fill up a, a position that uh, could use a little depth from the standpoint of um, injuries. Uh, Ligaris has been... Um, battled injuries for three or four years. And uh, he's a possibility as far as I can see. But it's not his uh, his play that worries me so much as has he become brittle? Well, you know, that, that that's, a t- that's a tough thing. You don't know. And, uh, you know, last year he was healthy coming into camp, and then, uh, you know, halfway through camp last year, he just he just broke down, and, uh, you know, he missed the whole season. I mean, that came out of nowhere. It looked like it was only going to be, you know, a, a month, six weeks, and he wound up uh, missing the whole year. So that, that's a concern, too. You don't know if he's going to hold up over a season. Well, thank God for Hicks from your standpoint. Yeah, Hicks has really turned to a to a heck of a player, and you know he can only get better because he's he's still a young guy. Yeah, that's why I say um, even if Ellsbury comes back to form, he's not likely to beat out Hicks for the starting position. No, and then you know you still got uh, Brett Gardner around, and you got Clint Frazier, right. so. Uh, you know, there's there's a bunch of guys he's got to jump over. But, you know, with, you, you never know with injuries. I mean, Ellsbury could step in and, and play a part this year. So we'll just have to wait and see. Right. Um, Gardner's been unsung for a lot of years. Um, I like him as a ball player. Well, me me too. Uh, he's, he's really scrappy. I mean, you know, I wish he would uh, – you know, cut down on the strikeouts and stuff. He's like seven all-time Yankee in strikeouts. I think he got a little power uh, hungry, too, after he hit 20 home runs in one year. But, I mean, his defense is excellent, and he's just a, a gritty player. You know, he uh, he works the count, and he just seems to, uh, you know, come up with uh, big plays all the time. So he, he's a good guy to have on your team, even at this uh, advanced age. Yeah, Yankees being power hungry is not a new thing. Um, I don't know if you and I have talked about the saga of Andy Carey, who happened to have uh, been born and raised in the city that I adopted to live in, um, Alameda, California. And um, he, with the Yankees, went on a tour of Japan after, um, uh, uh, I guess it was... 55. Was it 55? Okay. Yep. He tore it up in Japan, hitting for a lot of power and really muscling up. And um, Casey warned him. He said, don't don't ruin your swing. And he didn't listen. And he ended up uh, being one of those guys, like we talked about, uh, uh, just looking for power. And that was back then. So... Um, it's intriguing. Who was it that said Cadillac hitters drive Cadillacs or home run hitters drive Cadillacs? I think it was Ralph Kiner. Yeah, it was. Uh, yep, that, that was Kiner. I'm sure he uh, twisted the saying up, though, a little bit. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, 
Jack, let's go back in our memory a little bit, uh, a little hot stove baseball, and uh, because spring training is coming up, we're not going to have much uh, time during the year or as much uh, time to look back and uh, great teams, great players. There was the, in the 50s, the Yankees were blessed to have two terrific outfielders that uh, were very much the um, equal in talent. And one was a right-handed hitter and one was a left-handed hitter. Gene Woodling, the left-handed hitter, and Hank Bauer, number nine, um, in your scorecard. I think Woodling was 17, if I remember. No, I don't remember Woodling's number. Uh, Slaughter Slaughter wore number 17 uh, when he got there, but I'll have to look that up. Um, Maybe 11, Gene Woodling. In any event, uh, he... Those two were one of the first prototype cases for out-and-out platooning good ball players. And Casey was blessed with a, a deep outfield, of course, Mantle in center. He had serve. He had a bunch of guys. And he ended up platooning Bauer and Woodling and pissing them both off. Could you elaborate on that? Well, one of the things, Ralph, I had the pleasure of meeting Gene Woodling in the Yankee Fan Fest in like 90, 1993, and he was telling me, you know, Casey, he didn't platoon him as much as, you know, you would, you would think, because if you look at the records from 49 through 53, they, they, all, they played over 120 games apiece. And when the Yankees had a win, when they got in the World Series, you know, Woodling and Bauer was was in the lineup. But Casey said one thing. He said, Gene Woodling, if he's got something to say, he won't say it behind my back. He'll say it right to my face. <laughs> now, um, that, that's uh, really true, and neither would Casey. Casey wasn't the kind of guy who held in his feelings under any circumstances. And my Gene Woodling story is when – After uh, Woodling had a terrific career in the American League, he was traded uh, to Baltimore. I I think he went to Baltimore originally. He was with Washington for a while. But towards the end of his career, the Mets were formed. And he was – he had a bad knee at the time, but he was drafted by by the Mets and – There's a story of him, uh, Al Blumkin uh, tells this story, it's a a wonderful story, of Casey sitting on the bench next to Woodling, and it's batting practice, or maybe even during the game, and Casey looks over at him and says, things have changed a little, haven't they? (laughs) Yeah. And they have, because Casey went from managing the uh, perennial um, team of of the 50s. When we were growing up, it was just a great team. Win, lose, or draw, they were were in it every freaking year. And um, the Mets were so much the antithesis of that early on that I can imagine Woodling saying, wow, this is, this isn't for me under any circumstances. Um, I have a Hank Bauer story. Um, when I was a kid, we'd sit in the right field grandstand, my grandfather and I, first row in the, in the grandstand, and uh, Bauer, the right fielder, uh, same at, at the polo grounds for us, it was Mueller playing right right in front of our eyes when um, we sat in the, basically the same seats in the polo grounds. Grandstand was a great way to watch a ball game. And Hank would, uh, I'd always be screaming out to him something, and uh, he'd look up and smile once in a while. And, but he was very, very... Um, those smiles and the, any breaking concentration came few and far between. 
Well, one day I'm in the schoolyard playing stickball, and actually it was, I can remember where it was. This is 60 years ago. I remember where I was in the schoolyard. It was out by the handball wall, which we used as a pitch it in stickball, you know, um, one bounce type thing. And um, guy comes in to the park, and I hadn't known him. I hadn't seen him before. And uh, uh, he introduces it. He says, I'm Paul. And uh, you mind if I if I uh, jump in or play or whatever? And we played and talked a little bit. And uh, what's your name? Paul Bauer. Oh, any relation to Hank? He opens up his wallet, and he's got a, a Hank Bauer baseball card. I don't remember if it was signed or, or what have you. But he says, I'm his his nephew. And I, later on, I learned he must have been an orphan because um, Paul Bauer, senior, I guess, was Hank's brother who played, who was in the war in World War II. And yeah. Hank was a war hero. And Paul lost his life. And um, I remember Paul saying that of the two of us, he was far the better ball player. And well, well was, yeah, I, um, yeah, Ralph, can, can I throw something in on that? Uh, well, when Hank, Hank won two bronze stars and two purple hearts in the Second World War, and he had a brother, Herman, who was a catcher Herman. with the White Sox. Uh, okay, it wasn't – Yeah. kid's name was Paul, but the, uh, and he might have been a child uh, of another um, sibling. Yeah, he had a couple sibling. brothers. Okay, and, well, and, um, I confuse it. But it was I, Herman. Now that you mentioned it, um, that was the name. Herman dies in the war, and um, Hank did say that that um, Herman was the better athlete, the better ball player. Well, I was doing some research, and kill, and Herman got killed in France in 1944. And here, here's another uh, story when when uh, Hank Bauer was a sergeant. And he was on Okinawa, and he was on Guam. But would they let a Sergeant Bauer let a you know a, a charge or something on Okinawa, and 64 men went out and only six returned. Wow. And he was one of those that didn't. Yeah. So uh, you know it's. You know, those, those guys are the real her- heroes. I mean, what a generation that was. Yeah, all, all the guys we watched in the early 50s. Yogi had wartime. Of course, DiMaggio had wartime. Mantle didn't um, because of his uh, his uh, knees. Oste- osteomyelitis, I think it was. And it's, it's a leg infection that they almost, when Mantle was a kid, um, and came down with that. I think he was a football, high school football injury. He got kicked or what have you. He came close, from what I understand, to losing that limb. Yeah. Yeah, they wanted to cut his leg off. Right. Um, uh, uh, well, we n- never would have known all those things. Interesting man will stat. Mano played more baseball games than any other Yankee. I don't know if that's been broken since by anybody. But I, I think the, Jeter broke it, but it, that, that is an amazing stat with all the injuries Mickey had. Right, exactly. And um, he seemed to be out all the time. He wasn't out all the time, that's for sure. Um, uh, what, what an outfield. I'm looking I, in my mind's eye. I'm looking from that right field grandstand. I'm looking at Bauer. Then I'm looking at um, Mantle and Center. And in 61, which is the team 
that I always go back to in my memory because um, I think for all practical purposes, that was the best Yankee team of all of them. Um, Post dynasty of five in a row, let's put it that way. They were great. It was the year Maris and Mantle were going for the the home run uh, title. But of course, by 61, Maris was gone, went to Kansas City for the aforementioned Maris, and um, that gave him, like I say, Berra and and Lopez uh, platooning and left, the best defensive infield I ever saw in person. At Boyer at third, Ubeck, Richardson, and Pepitone. Maybe Pepitone was 62, as you... Yeah, well, well Moose, Moose was there in 61 and 62. And then uh, Pepe come in in 63. Because the mafia asked Pepe, you want me to break Moose's leg? And, and Joe said, no, I'll win it the right way. <laughs> <laughs> Our old friend and a listener to this um, show, Jack O'Hallorhan, he's really become a, a regular. I'm, I'm sure he smiled at that. We haven't talked Yankees. He hinted to me that he has some roots in the Bronx after my Bronx Roots show on on this network. And maybe we'll get him on and uh, have him talk about his memories and uh, either verify that story or um, discount it. Uh, he's been known to surprise me in um, his his uh, tales of being a made man in the mafia, son of Albert Anesthesia, professional football player, and a heavyweight ranked boxer. It's just uh, and a, and an author and a very very articulate guy, who's um, got some thoughts that I don't always agree with, but he's fun to debate with and fun to listen to. So um, maybe you can give me a Jack O'Hallorhan story just off off the top of your head that he might be amused at. at. Well, the thing is, Ralph, I'd love to talk to Jack about, uh, you know, the John Kennedy, because the story was Traficante wanted to kill Jack Kennedy in Tampa. And, you know, Kennedy went to, to Dallas, and that's where he got shot. But, I, but I'd love to hear, you know, some of Jack's stories, because down here in, in Tampa, you know, Traficante ran uh, – the mafia down here but the thing i remember about jack was a boxer and you know in the old days you know you get the daily news and those guys used to fight all the time and i know he fought uh you know he was he fought at the garden i think he was on the undercard and joe frazier fought george Chavallo, and chuck wepner was on that and i and you know i know he had a lot of great fights he fought nine or ten times a year a couple times so he's a guy, I mean, uh, he's got more stories than, uh, you know, there is stories. I could listen to him all night. He and I have talked about that Kennedy assassination, and he talks about the millionaires in Texas, the oil millionaires that um, Joe Kennedy offended, so to speak, when he uh, forgot who got his kid into the White House and basically through Bobby Kennedy – um, wanted to destroy the mafia. And uh, he hints around, more than hints around, that the mafia was involved in the, in the assassination. And he talks about one thing that I don't agree with. Uh, he talks about the Magruder's tape and that it's his feeling that the limousine driver turned around and shot Jack Kennedy. And there are parts of the Magruder tape that he says are missing, this, that, and the other thing. I don't think that happened. The limo driver, if nothing else, 
was slow to peel away. He um, it took him a long time to to get out of of uh, harm's way, and I think other shots were fired afterwards and what have you. But I disagree with him vehemently. I don't think that limo driver or secret service agent turned around and shot Jack Kennedy. But everything else I've talked to about um, the, the mafia with with Jack seems to make sense. And um, you mentioned Pepitone. Pepitone was definitely um, who my grandmother would have, would have called a hoodlum. He's, he's, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you, you heard that expression. When you were oh, 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 all the time, all the time. He's nothing but a hoodlum. <laughs> yeah, now, you want to grow up and be a hoodlum? <laughs> yeah, that's what he <laughs> But I, I'll tell you, he made, and we've talked about this for, before when we did a Pepitone show, he made my grandfather happy in his, uh, in my grandfather's later years. Uh, Joe, uh, Joe Pepitone hit a home run in both games of a Sunday doubleheader in, I would venture to say it was 1970. May 18th, 1969. <laughs> I was at the game, Ralph. Um, it was two or three months after I got out of the Air Force, and I had decided to stay out in California, and um, I called my grandparents every weekend. Uh, call, collect, revoice the charges, my grand grandmother would say, you know, voice the charges, and so I did, and, and we talk, and uh, at the time I, I talked to him that, e- that evening, I didn't even realize that he had really taken to the Yankees as much as he had, because, you know, the Mets had been in for uh, four or five years. But he was a Bronx guy, and in his heart, I think, even though he raised me as a Giant fan because we love going out and seeing Willie, he also um, still retained his love for for the Yankees from way back. And um, good memories for me, good family memories for me. Who was um, who were some of the people? from your family that introduced you to baseball? Well, you know, know, the thing is, Ralph, I mean, my dad died early. So, you know, I just had my grandmother and, uh, you know, my mom. So they didn't really follow sports. But I was just always, you know, sports crazy. You know, I said that was always my thing. And, uh, you know, I just started watching the Yankees in like 63. And, you know, it was great. My mom and my uncle, they, they took me to the games and they always, you know, supported me in whatever I wanted to do. So, uh, you know, I, I just still remember my grandmother saying, oh, it's just good, clean fun. It, you know, it's great that, you, you know, you have su- such a love for sports. But, but let, let me tell you a Pepitone story, Ralph. Okay. I was at a card show and Joe was signing autographs and stuff and the fans loved him. So this one woman goes up, and Joe's flirting with her and talking. So she gets done, and she walks back, and she goes, Jesus, he's got more makeup on than I do. <laughs> Joe was a vain guy. He was the yeah. guy with the, hair, the hair dryer and the, and the wig. He'd be blowing out his wig. And I remember that it was the change in Yankees. So they went from the old school to the new school. He had the treasures and the Pepitones and the, the Kubeks and the Richardsons coming up. It was a new era. And some of them, like Bouton and Pepitone, were pushing the envelope as to what the Yankees' image was all about. And Bill Lenz, uh, yeah. Phil ends with the harmonica and uh, and Pepitone with the hair dryer. They were letting the players go a little, little bit. Now, um, express a little individuality. It wasn't like that in the in the days of of Bauer and Silvera and 
and Woodling and uh, Tommy Henrik and I mean these guys were just intense for for the money for the World Series money. I remember DiMaggio's uh, statement: "Just don't fuck up my money." <laughs> That's what he said in the, to every rookie. He says we expect to we expect to win, and um, I, there's the great story of um, maybe you can tell it better than I. I'm sure you can of Yogi Berra not hustling one one day not, um, as a catcher and DiMaggio uh, coming down on him. Do you remember that story? Well, the thing is, it, it was a doubleheader. And, you know, it was 90-some degrees, and Yogi didn't want to play in the second game. And Joe D. come over, he says, you know, uh, are, are you sick? Are you hurt? What, what's wrong with you? You know, look, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, an old, look at, I'm an old man. I'm going to play in the second game. Why aren't you? And, you know, I think Yogi got the message. And another thing, Ralph, Hank Bauer used to police that locker room, too. And, I mean, the players had nothing but respect for the Hank Bauer. I mean, his face looked like a fist. And, uh, you know, Hank was the real deal. You wouldn't want to mess with Hank Bauer. No, as um, the guy at the Copacabana might tell you. Yeah, I think they, he, was a, he was a bowler, and they were giving Sammy Davis a hard time. And, uh, you know, Hank Bauer and Billy Martin went in the, the men's room with the bowling guys, and uh, Hank and Billy Martin come out, and the bowlers uh, come out on a stretcher. <laughs> right. right. Now, we knew about uh, Billy Martin's fighting uh, pugilism, but we didn't know about Bauer. It was the only time that we heard about it. And it was Billy Martin that ends up uh, leaving the Yankees. Weiss hated him and was looking for an excuse. And um, But Bauer goes on after his playing career, manages the, the Baltimore Orioles uh, to a pennant, as a matter of fact. 66. 66, absolutely. Uh, the, he was a leader of men, and... He died too early as well. Well, I, I'll tell you, Ralph, uh, you know, Hank Bauer was actually a manager in the Met organization. Really? Like 70, 71, and he won the manager of the year. He was a manager in AAA. And, you know, he didn't get promoted to be the Met manager, and, he, you know, he said the hell with it after that. And, you know, he, later he became a Yankee scout, but maybe you can refresh my memory who was the Met manager after Gil Hodges and before Yogi? Um, uh, no, after Gil Hodges, Yogi was named manager. Okay. Gil okay. Hodges, and it was the cla- is the most classless thing the Mets ever did, and you know that's a long list. <laughs> They're sixty years <laughs> old, and I I will tell this story at. At Gill's funeral, the Mets announce the new manager in Yogi at Gill's funeral. Now, what they were trying to do is basically save the cost of uh, getting together a a press conference later on, and they um, announced Yogi Berra uh, as the manager. Very classless. To, to yeah, I mean, that, that's a terrible thing to do. And, uh, you know, everybody said it, and it's the truth. Gil Hodges should be in the Hall of Fame. No question about that. And I used to have the idea that um, Gil Hodges should be in the Hall of Fame if for no other reason his managerial career was, uh, of course, it was cut short by an early demise, but he was the – if anybody was responsible for that 69 miracle, it was Gil Hodges. There were two people in spring training in 69 with the Mets that believed the Mets could win the World Series or at least be contenders at that point. I don't even know if they dreamt of the World Series. Remember, they were uh, uh, horrible up till then, all – six or seven years. Well, one of them was 
was um, Jerry Grody, and the other one was Gil Hodges, and um, he he stuck with them and believed them. And Grody saw that pitching staff being as great as it was. He caught them, and he had an inkling that uh, Seaver was about to come into his real prime. Kuzmin, Gentry, they had Nolan Ryan at the time. Um, but Gil Hodges was the guy that um, that was the believer, and he should be in the Hall of Fame for those reasons, him being a manager. But I've been convinced, looking back at the stats and looking back at, at the era, when he retired, he was the the number one home run hitter, right-handed home run hitter. Easy for me to say, but <laughs> he had more home runs than any other right-handed batter uh, when he retired. So, yes, definitely. And he was a pretty damn good defensive first baseman. And Well, again, you know it, it makes you wonder, Ralph. I mean, you got Campy in there, you got Jackie Robinson in there, you got Pee Wee in there, and Kovacs and Drysdale, and I mean, Gil Hodges Snyder. was. And yeah, Deuce Snyder. that's right. I, how can you? I, how can I forget the Duke Snyder? And I mean, maybe because all those guys are in the Hall of Fame, maybe that hurt Gil a little bit because he wasn't like, uh, you know, outspoken and stuff. He was just. Uh, a dependable, great player every day you could re- you could rely on. Well, um, should be in, no, no question about it. And it's a shame that it didn't happen in, in his lifetime. Of course, it couldn't. Uh, obviously, a shame. Man was forty nine years old. Um, wow. Uh, yeah. Mortality sucks. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, Ralph. My 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 dad had a heart attack. He was twenty eight. So, <laughs> oh, really? you just never know. Oh, uh, uh, 28. W- was that genetic? Was, was there any um, history of heart problems in, in your family? No, uh, well, I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you a quick story, Ralph. It was March of 1958. Now, I was like a year and a half old. And what happened is he worked for the highway. And they put away all the, you know, the trucks for the snow. It was 60 degrees, and two days later, it snowed. And back then, when they used to, you know, sand the roads, they had to get in the back of the truck with a shovel and shovel the sand into the roads. And he worked like 60, 70 hours straight, and he had a heart attack. And, uh, you know, after that, they changed. You know, you can only work uh, so many hours of overtime. I am so sorry for your loss. Well, the thing is, Ralph, I, I felt sorry for my mom. She was 26, and, you know, that affected her life forever. So, uh, you know, that that's that's another story we can get into right. sometime. But, uh, right. you know, uh, it, it, it it's tough growing up, uh, growing up without parents, and I, and I have sympathy for kids uh, who have to go through that. Jack, do you have siblings? Uh, no. Okay, aunts, uncles that uh, filled in. Well, most most of my family's gone, Ralph. They they've been gone for a long time. But uh, you know, you know, I'm tough, and uh, you grow up tough, and you, and you you know you know you appreciate the good things in life. And uh, the good thing is, you can see people, you can see the good, and you can see the bad. And there's a lot of bad in the world, but I'll tell you, there's a lot more good people than bad. Very well said, and uh, of unfortunately, Ralph, they're not in politics. <laughs> no, no, very few are. Um, and even I'll, I'll tell you what you said: politics. You got my button for the day. <laughs> my, button, my button for the day. And if anybody out there listening, you think you've seen some low shit in politics, and you, you some egos get in the way. Camelia Harris is about to run, make a run for president. She's got maybe 14 or 15 other candidates, but she's as well-spoken, as qualified, as educated, as articulate, good spirit, good democratic spirit. 
Well, I'm out in California, and she's from California. And there's a man out here named Willie Brown. I don't know if you ever heard of Willie Brown, but Willie Brown was a state senator, led the, the state senate, <coughs> excuse me, was the mayor of San Francisco for a long time. He was one of those guys that was the epitome of being a politician. And yeah. plus he was a Democrat. And... Um, he got things done, and he uh, terrific guys in his 80s, still writes a column. The other day, he comes out with something as asinine as anything I've ever heard out of a politician's mouth, or an ex-politician, or a man with a brain, or how are you going to say it? He says, oh, I stopped Camelia Harris back in the day. Uh, As if to imply that she was um, using her body to get political favors. Now, that may be true, but the coming out with that, just, you know, he's this big ladies' man. He says, oh, yes, I was separated from my wife and uh, that and the other thing. To he's an old man now, and to put himself in the spotlight and to uh, give his ego something um, absolutely sickened me. So, oh God! Um, if you had to mention politics when we're talking baseball, you got my response. And uh, every day it's something bad with the unholy. Yeah. Well, well, Ralph, uh, maybe I, I'll tell you uh, I'll tell you a funny story. You know how you always hear, like, the mafia and Jack mentions, you know, they have honor, they didn't rat, they didn't tell anybody anything? Right. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story. My grandmother fell and broke her hip when she was 91 years old. And the cops come over and the ambulance come over and they asked her her name, information, Ralph, she wouldn't tell them a damn thing, nothing. She wouldn't tell them her name. She didn't tell them where she lived. She went to the hospital. They asked her questions. She wouldn't tell them anything, absolutely nothing. So I was standing there, and she go, and they asked her, goes, do you know this guy? And she goes, I don't know who he is, but he ain't bad looking. <laughs> 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 this is at 91 about her grandson. Yeah. But, but Ralph, she didn't tell anybody a damn thing. She wouldn't speak. She wouldn't say nothing. She says, I'm too old. I don't remember anything. And oh. the fact that I'm telling you the story now, I know she might have me whacked or something, but she didn't tell anybody anything. Well, um, <laughs> nobody's going to have you whacked at, the, at this age. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you're giving me a little hint that uh, you might have had some family connect yourself as well as Jack. No, I'll tell you, Ralph, I lived in a little town, and there was a lot of Italians there. So it could have been, you know, we were 50 miles from New York and stuff like that. So there was a lot of funky stuff going on in my little town. <laughs> I could, I could well imagine, and maybe it's best that we both know know about that that stuff. You know, um, Jack hints at stuff all the time, and I think to myself, do I want to know? I want to know. I have this insatiable curiosity, and um, but do I really want to know? And did uh, curiosity really end up killing the cat, or did it just? Uh, was satisfaction that brought him back. Well, the, the thing is, Ralph, when, when Jack talks, there's, these are the things that people should hear. Maybe right. they don't oh, want right. to hear this kind of stuff, but this is the stuff you need to hear because, you know, they get scared when they hear this stuff because they don't want to believe it. It, it destroys a lot of the illusions that you, you grow up with. So well, I'll tell you what, what shattered my illusions was that, Jack's family had more integrity than what I call 
I allude to the unholy trinity of big business, government, and organized religion. And they conspire to mess up our lives in a billion different ways. And there's much more integrity in Jack's family than in government, in big business, and then organized religion. And in 90% of the families that I've known, you know, people I've known, how they relate, including myself, to their families and what have you, including my my uh, relatives, Jack's family had a lot of integrity. Uh, hard to believe for some people. And Jack's family of mafioso killers and this, that, and the other thing, they did nothing. They served nothing but to safen, make safer the neighborhoods that folks lived in. And they didn't just kill strangers or kill outside members. 99% of, of what you hear, even the death of Jack's dad, Albert Anastasia, was within the family, within the, the families arguing uh, with each other, this, that, and the other thing. Um, I learned a lot about the integrity of, of the mafia, and um, I w- I'd rather stand by Jack than, um, than any, any representative, these millionaires representing us in Congress and in, in the Senate. It's absolutely pitiful what they're doing to the working class. And um, and that's my rant for today. Well, I'll tell you, Ralph, I lived in a little town, Netcon, and for 48 years, I didn't, never had anything stolen out of my house. You never thought any difference of leaving stuff in the front yard, the backyard, I come down here to Tampa. We didn't have key, we didn't have keys yeah. in the door in those days. The doors were left open. Um, it, it's a different world. And if you had people in your neighborhood that were connected or whatever, it served to keep the riffraff out. And um, that's just a fact. When the, um, the Kennedys basically killed the mafia and um, it um, didn't serve them very well to do it. Let's put it that way. Well, one of the things I was reading, Ralph, I don't know if this is true. It's Travacante. His lawyer was also Jimmy's Hoffa's lawyer. And they said four days. Yeah. Four days. Before Traficante died, he was with his lawyer. I forget the man's name now. And he says, we shouldn't have killed John. We should have killed Bobby. Whoa. So that's something we can discuss. <laughs> like I say, uh, well, Ralph, I, I don't know if told it's me true. Once that, um, that there was some question about whether or not that hit was supposed to take place in Tampa which was the last place that John Kennedy um, was before he went to San Antonio. November 18th, because they named that street after him. Dallas. Yeah, they they named that street after him here in Tampa. And, you know, it's just a nondescript street, Ralph. It's only like two lanes, and, you know, it's just regular buildings on the side. There's no, like, high-rises or anything. It's just like a... Uh, you know, like a a town go, uh, two uh, two uh, streets going through uh, you know a little neighborhood. So it's not like anything uh, you know outstanding or nothing. Okay. Before we go, you're in Tampa. Would you give us uh, an update on the stadium situation? What well, we as of this last week. As of right now, Ralph, I, I think they're waiting until the end of spring training for maybe Tampa will come up with something. But the way I see it, I, I don't think it's, it's going to happen. What the big hope was, was, was Jeff Venick, who's done a great job with the Lightning hockey. They were hoping he was going to have a stadium down by the waterfront, something like San Francisco. 
and they kept on waiting for him to step up, and he never said, any, said anything. And then they come up with that outside Ybor City. Personally, Ralph, I hope St. Pete, you know, at least they're going to get a fighting chance. But personally, I feel that baseball, Tampa, St. Pete, you're not going to see it after 200, uh, 2027. Okay. That's a good educated guess. Um, and I'm sorry to, to hear that. Um, um, any place that they may go that's, um, that stands out in your head, um, there are a number of, pl- number of places open. Uh, what city is a good candidate to get a, a team as far as you can see? Well, I'll just throw this in, Ralph. You know what it might have been a good place to have the Rays where the Yankees are at Steinbrenner Field <laughs> because you got the field there already and you got the parking from Raymond James Stadium. So that was good. But, of course, you know, you wouldn't have the Yankees here. And if the Yankees left, they, I'd go with them. I, I think, Ralph, I think Las Vegas. That's what I think would be a, a great expansion city. Um. You know, the A's just bought the rights to Vegas because they have their AAA team there. And the A's and the Rays have been um, suffering from stadiumitis uh, uh, concurrently uh, for a long time. And the A's have some proposals out there and things that look close, but the shovel's not in the ground. And I was thinking, uh, and I mouthed this on an A's show on the network recently, that the A's might be a candidate to go to Vegas. So, um, oh, yeah, you you pick a booming area, and um, that very well could be it. Isn't it interesting with the gambling, how years ago, oh, couldn't couldn't have a team in Vegas, that would... That would be horrible. Now the Raiders are down there um, in a different sport, obviously. Um, could happen. The hockey team. Those two teams. The hockey team is doing incredible out there. They were in the Stanley Cup Finals last year. <laughs> as a first year, as an expansion team. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're setting attendance records, and the Raiders will draw. I mean, I, I don't think it'd be too long before you – you see baseball out there, Major League Baseball. No question. Um, I just hope it can come through expansion because I'm adverse to teams moving. Not, I mean, give it every chance. Get a new owner. If your team can't, if an owner can't sustain the team, there should be some eminent domain come into play where, no, we're not going to move, and we're not going to break kids' hearts anymore. And I can think of the franchises that have moved and the kids being 11 years old when it, when it happens, and I'm one of them. I was 11 when the Giants moved, and it, it's just damaging. It's a, a loss. And I had a friend um, who was a psychologist um give me an eye-opening thing. She said, you know, th- that's really a, a shocking thing for a kid. That's trauma. Uh, that's loss. Like, you lost your dad, and I'm not in any way comparing oh. to, to losing a, a family member, but it all adds up into um, in your head. And um, I was traumatized, Um when the when the Giants moved, so you know. Well, I mean, the thing is, Ralph, it's like a loss of innocence. And if you grow up, as I mean, like my family was very loyal to each other. I mean, you just stayed together forever. You know, loyalty was the most important quality. You stayed with each other regardless of what happened. And you would hope, you know, your sports team would do the same. But when you see every, you know, like greed rules everything, and and you know that that's like a a hard lesson to learn. Right, and uh, we didn't know it as kids, but it was so much of a business back then as it is today. It just uh, changed the decimal points a little bit, but there was always the adversarial position of management 
and the teams. And in those days, the owners owned the players. They really did. They controlled their destiny. Um, you could be backed up in the minors as a first baseman um, playing behind Lou Gehrig and spend four or five years uh, of your career. Um, a good example of that was Hank Sauer, who yeah. started, his, started his career as a Yankee, um, backed up uh, in the minors, and uh, escaped eventually, but so many didn't. Um, anyway, uh, you mentioned hockey a minute ago, and I want to talk about something real quick before we get off the air. You were uh, an Easterner, you were a hockey fan back then, and you told me something off the air. We mentioned Jack McCartan the Ranger goalie who played played maybe one or two games as a Ranger uh, as a backup. But before that, he was an Olympic hero in the 1960 Olympics. He was the goalie for the, um, uh, for, for the Olympics. And in those days when I was a kid and you were a kid, the, the hockey teams didn't carry – a backup goalie with them. So if the goalie got injured, they had what they call house goalies. They had guys yep. that uh, uh, maybe had played some in the minor leagues, that were uh, in the press corps or in the publicity department of the team, or but they'd come in. And I remember, I don't remember the goalie who got hurt. It might have been Gump. As a matter of fact, because it was sixty and uh, is pre Um so Gump gets hurt, and I'm listening. Uh, what I did in my growing up in my mother's kitchen, the radio was on top of the refrigerator, and the family would be watching TV, this, that, and the other thing, and I'm in the kitchen, hugging the refrigerator, listening to the Ranger game. Or the Knicks would be on, or you know. But yeah. I would just have that radio on all the time. And I remember when McCartan came in for the injured goalie. Uh, again, it must have been Gump. And um, I remember the Jim Gordon was the the radio announcer. And uh, I remember him talking about the Olympics and this, that, and the other thing in McCartan. And um, I'm sure he was wearing number 30 <laughs> as backup goalies wore. But um, I remember that game on the radio like it was yesterday. And you told me I had no idea what um, what McCartan did after after that. He had only only been up with the Rangers those few games, uh, one at least, maybe not even any more. But 10 years later, you told me that he was playing in the WHL. Um, yeah, it was the, the Minnesota right. Fighting Saints. Ah, okay. And, and was, I, you know I looked up his stats, and he, you know, he played a couple games with the Rangers. But it was interesting to find out he played ten or eleven years later. So he must have been in his, you know, early thirties when he came back. But uh, hey. you know, it's just interesting to see that. Yeah, we're talking about expansion. How expansion came on very quickly in hockey. Um, not only did the NHL expand. But uh, the World Hockey League comes in, and it really thinned it out, and it's taken years. But um, hockey's back up in terms of depth, and um, it's going strong. And uh, if anybody's out there hasn't ever been to a hockey game, wow, go. It's not a game that transcends to TV, so you miss a lot. But go in person, and um, you'll get hooked, I'm sure. Well, 
One of the things, Ralph, the thing I miss most about being down in Florida, it, you know, I miss New Jersey because going to the games, going to the Ranger games at the Garden, it was a tremendous experience. You know, you'd get on the bus in Dover and you'd make like 12, 15 stops going into Penn Station and people would get on. They'd all have their Ranger jerseys on. It was just electric. It was a great atmosphere. And you were talking about expansion. So I don't remember these guys with the Rangers, but I remember Harry Howell with the California Golden Seals, and I remember Andy Bathgate with the Pittsburgh Penguins. (laughs) Whoa. I remember Bathgate was traded initially for Phil Nevin to the Rangers from Toronto. And Nevin was a a good two-way player, but... Um, no Andy Bathgate at, at all. Bathgate was uh, tremendous. The line when I was growing up, the number one line was Ingerfield at center, Prentice at left wing, and Andy Bathgate at right wing. Um, well, I remember the goal of the game line. It was Rattel, Gilbert, and Hatfield. Yes. And I was... Uh, I don't, you, See, Ralph, I don't know if you remember this. When they used to show the games on WOR Channel 9, they used to be on tape delay. Say they were playing, the Rangers were playing in Boston, and they wouldn't start, start the game on Channel 9 till like 9 o'clock. And they used to do the same thing with the Knicks. They used to be on tape delay. Right. Well, the, the line that you talk about, and that must have been 1964, 67, 68. Yeah, through through that then. In 1964, I might have told you, I know I've told this story on the comfortably zoned airwaves. I would be an autograph freak, and I'd go down for autographs. And um, But when you go down, when you live in New York, you don't get many of, like for the Rangers, they lived in, in New York. They didn't come in on on Mars, you couldn't get them in the hotels or whatever. But one day I am um, I'm waiting to get into a hockey game, and I purchased a Ranger Blue Book. And maybe I purchased it uh, a couple of weeks before, but I'm sure I did because I brought it down in a in a self addressed envelope, and I gave the Ranger Blue Book. I asked, um, it was Val Fontaine, penalty killer, killed penalties with Camille Henry. Nondescript kind of guy and um, happened to run into him outside of the Ranger dressing room. Um, And I said, would you do me a favor could you take this book and um, ha- have your teammates sign it and return it to me in this envelope? And the guy does. And I have it to this day. It's the Ranger Blue Book, little yearbook, little five-by-eight yearbook. Yep. And it ha- he got went into the Ranger locker room, got everybody in that blue book to sign it, and the names, Joubert, uh, Rattel, Hatfield, Jacques Plante was the goalie. At that okay. Time. And I've got a Jacques Plante. The only autograph I didn't get was a guy who recently passed away in the past few weeks, uh, Villamir. The goalie, Gilles Villamir. Goalie, yeah, he was... Uh, obviously not there, uh, either in the minors at that that time or um, they just didn't sign it. But everybody who played on that hockey team um, signed that book, and that's one of the things that I have uh, right next to my Bobby Chance um, uh, autograph. You know where that came from. Well, well Ralph, I'll, I'll tell you a quick one. I used to go to the Ranger games with my friend uh, Fred. He's been a season ticket holder for 17 years. But anyway, the game would get over 940. So the bus would go, I mean, the train would go back to Dover at 1030. So Fred go and do his thing, and I would go out 
and get my three hamburgers and soda, and it would be like 10 o'clock, and I'd stand by and wait for the players to come out, you know. You're talking and, about Needix where you got your soda. Yeah. Well, that was a little before my time. This this was a McDonald, McDonald's right next to a porn shop. So, uh, okay. Yeah, this well, is before was the, the city got cleaned up. Were you going to the pawn shop and happened to be stopping for a bite to eat? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, Ralph, you know, I was waiting for, you know, the players to come out. I had like 20, 25 minutes to, to uh, kill. And who come walking out over at the side was Joe Namath. Oh, wow. So I got Joe Namath to sign uh, a hockey program for me, and I still have it. So that's my hockey story, <laughs> Joe Namath. Probably the only hockey program that Joe Namath ever signed. It could be one of the most valuable autographs in history. Well, he signed a hockey puck for the one guy, and I was just standing there, and he signed a beautiful autograph. So that was a big thrill because, you know, I always loved Joe Namath. Oh, yeah, what's not to love about Joe Willie and his memory? Wow. Um, we're, I guess it was Jack I was talking to the other day about the improbable. wanted to get some idea about whether that game was on the up and up. It was the the Jet game when they played Baltimore. It was before Super Bowls. It was the NFL championship, AF, A, AFL-NFL championship, and it made all the difference in the world. It, it um, That game, the Jets winning – gave uh, credence to the fact that you could merge and you're going to get a somewhat equal uh, representation. And uh, I remember that game being carried b- both on CBS and NBC. Yep. And uh, Joe Namath, uh, he flat out said, we're going to win. Um, bravado, uh, some knowledge is – as to what was going to happen. Uh, uh, Jack uh, didn't give me any hint of that game not being on the up and up, even though it meant so much and there were so many people involved that needed the Jets to win so they could um, they could merge. And, um, uh, and we may never know, but I remember reading something either in a column or one of his books, and it was, um, uh, boy, his name skips, skips, uh, who was Pete Hamill's great uh, writing companion? Jimmy Breslin? Jimmy Breslin wrote a book or an article implying that that game might not be on the up and up, and I haven't been able to verify that, but I could remember reading that and something to do with Bubba Smith. Uh, Baltimore was so talented, and I can still see in my mind's eye Jimmy Orr standing in the end zone. And I can still uh, recall that they didn't go to Johnny Unitas off the bench when Morrill really wasn't having a great game. Uh, And they didn't go to him to a for a long time. So well, uh, uh, as a big Jet fan, uh, and I mean a real big Jet fan, because I was in the Air Force then, stationed at Travis in, in, uh, in Northern California, and um, I remember watching that game I, uh, um, in Southern California at a buddy's, buddy's house. I had to leave or wh- whatever, and I... Uh, it was the best moment I ever had as a sports fan, as a um, because I was too young to remember when the when the Giants in '54 I knew they won, but I don't have the clarity of, of that. Um, but the Jets winning um, was unbelievable, and that was before the Mets won. Jets won in '68, and the in the 68-69 season. But um, I'll always have some doubt was that game on the up and up. Got no hint well, from Jack. But. That, yeah, that that was, a you know, uh, 
That was a great game. You know, I was always a Packer fan, but I always liked Joe Namath, and I used to be a Jet season ticket holder. And don't forget in 69, Ralph, the Jets won, the Mets won, and the Knicks won. I don't think the yes. Knicks have won a game since then. So, <laughs> let alone a let alone a playoff game. <laughs> no, they, the, the Knicks were bitten in. I thought they had a terrific team when they were coming up against um, uh, MJ, uh, Michael Jordan in in the nineties. Um, say what you want about Patrick. He may not have been able to read as as uh, he was taunted at, Ge- at Georgetown, but he was a damn good center, and um, they came close to beating beating Chicago. But since well, then... Yeah. The game I remember, Ralph, was game six or seven, and Michael Jordan shot 30 foul shots. How the hell can one player shoot 30 foul shots? Um, I'll ask you, would you say Jordan was greater than, um, any basketball player before or since? Well, I'm going to start an argument. The the best player I think all time was Wilt Chamberlain. Okay. uh, When you average 50 points a game and if Wilt had that killer instinct, like say like a Bill Russell, who was a great player and, you know, a, a real winner, I, I think th- there was nothing Wilt couldn't do. I mean, when you average 50 points a game, and, uh, and I mean, that, that's on, unbelievable. You know, on, at, when he was a sixer, became a defensive player and proved that he wasn't all offense, and he did something that very few athletes do in this sport. He changed the rules. They expanded the, the lane The um, used to be a T, more uh, of a T, and that um, to keep the the three second rule going, um, they expanded it. So he had an incredible of effect on, on basketball. Um, I thought you were going to say Oscar, when, um, oh, but you said Wilt, and that that's a good argument. Oscar's a, a good argument. Um, well, yeah. Ralph, I I, I got to tell you, I did see Wilt Chamberlain once. I sat a few rows from him. I was at the U.S. Open tennis, and he was watching the women's matches. I think he was trying to add to his ten thousand total. But you when know, you when you see somebody like Wilt up close, it, it was incredible. He was in the third row, and his his speed is like three rows over. It was it was incredible just to see. Him. Well, a Wilt a Wilt Chamberlain story in his rookie year with the Philadelphia Warriors. He's in to the garden to play what turned out to be, and this is a night game, and we're like 14 or 15, and Marty Rose and I, uh, Marty from the Met Show on the station, my friend since second grade, literally. Yeah, I'm familiar with him. Um Marty and I go to a a game, a Nick game against the Warriors, Wilt's rookie year, and you got to remember the Knicks sucked back in those days. <laughs> I mean, with a capital S, and um, they're playing the Warriors, and it's a triple overtime, and we're kids, and all parents are allowing us to go out at night. Speaking of the times, they were safer times and we're on subways and what have you, and it's getting to be 11.30, 12 o'clock at night, nowhere to call, um, and we got home at 12.30. Our parents were just beside themselves, but we watched the Knicks against Wilt win a triple overtime game, and uh, it was either Willie Knowles or Johnny Green. We were sitting okay. in in the balcony, in the side balcony, or the end balcony, and uh, looking right down upon Willie, uh, Willie Knowles. Or I, Marty thinks it was Willie Knowles. I think it was Johnny Green. Got that last rebound, and they won 
a triple overtime game. Wow. wow. And that was Wilt's first year, and what a difference. Uh, what a difference he made. Um, and what, Was Richie Guerin on that team? Uh, must have been Richie Guerin. And if you want to treat yourself, you and any of, any of our listeners, there is on YouTube a an all star game in its um, complete all star game that Richie Guerin was in, and you know Wilt is playing against Russell, and West is playing against Oscar, and this is sixty one or sixty two. And Garen is coming off the bench for the East. And you got Sam Jones. And you got Greer. And you got Dave Bing. And you got all these tremendous ball players playing in an all star game. And you, you have to watch it. You, you just, um, these guys are playing the old fashioned ways, the Havlicek way of being in. Um, of getting in position without the ball. You know, it's what you do in basketball in the old days. It wasn't just bring the ball up and shoot. It was weaving and passing and what have you. And you mentioned Garen, and Garen in that game was unbelievable. He sh- Richie Garen was a very, very underrated ball player. Um, that, that's what brought up that um, that thought and that league was so deep eight teams ten guys um, ten guy ten man rosters you know, we just had some great basketball yeah I mean I, I never I remember Richie Garrett as a coach see that was just a little before my time I, I started picking up basketball like 67 but you know I remember Russell and Oscar and Jerry West and Baylor and you know, it was just a great time to uh, watch basketball. I mean, it, now I know I sound like an old timer, but the game was better then. Everybody could shoot the ball, and now it's just like let's shoot three pointers and dribble between our legs and miss layups. I mean, that's what it seems to me. Well, um, no question that the athletic ability has improved from then to now. The guys we're talking about um, athletically were not as good as the guys today. Wilt notwithstanding, Wilt, if Wilt in his prime played today, he would still be Wilt. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing I'm talking about, Ralph, the, the athletes today are talented. They're more talented, but are they more skilled? That, that's uh, the question. That I would... They're not. They can't play uh, um, below the rim. They're talented, and that shows through over the rim. But um, certainly the passing is uh, has been neglected, just like, as we say in baseball, the home run is, is the big thing. Now it's, um, it's the shooting. It's three points. Um, that sort of thing. So, no, the um, the athleticism is improved, but technically and fundamentally, it's la- the game is lacking. And a lot of that has to do with the one-and-out situation in college basketball. Before, you'd get these guys would stick around for like a minor league career, and um, big time college basketball was like minor league, be- minor league, and they developed teamwork and they developed skills and what have you. And now it's one and out. You just uh, so the college game is different, and that transcends to the pro game. Well, to give you an instant, uh, you know, a story, Ralph. Kevin Knox, who's with the Knicks now, was playing for Tampa Catholic two years ago. Last year he's with Kentucky, and this year he's with the Knicks. So he's a 19-year-old kid, and, you know, he's lucky he's with the Knicks because they're not going nowhere. He can play. But a lot of these guys, they don't, know, they don't learn how to play. And the coaches in, 
in basketball, for me, the best college coach is Gino Aminetti, the women's coach for Connecticut. That guy is incredible. He, to me, he's the best coach. And some of the women coaches who have made the Hall of Fame, uh, um, who did he succeed? Great women's coach at Connecticut. There, there's, I'm not sure. There was a coach summit, Pat Summit, but she yeah. wasn't he, yeah, and there and there's a few others, but uh, well, we can't forget uh, what you, know, you got Sue Bird, and you got the woman in, in the NBA now. She's a coach. She was a coach with the Warriors. I can't remember her name offhand, but uh, you know the women are good. I go up to USF and watch the women's game as well as the men, and the the, the women can shoot better than the men. There's no question. Yeah. Hey, before we get off, you mentioned the name that I really loved, Harry Howell. The range of fans would, and you call them fans, they would give Harry a horrible time. He came down from Montreal, and they called him Harriet, and get your purse, Harriet. He, he wasn't a checker, and this, that, and the other thing. And I didn't know that he had played with the Golden Seals in uh, California. Well, that was towards the end. But, uh, you know, I'll have to look it up, Ralph, but that's what I remember, you know, Harry Howell with the California Golden Seals. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, don't even look it up. Let it stay in your head. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't prove yourself. Sometimes you don't want to look things up. You prove, prove your memory is wrong. Jack, this is terrific talking to you. I'm glad we got off into some of the other sports in our boyhood and, uh, I'm getting to know you a little bit, and uh, it's really a privilege. You're a square shooting guy. Well, Ralph, it's, it's always a pleasure, and any time I can talk sports, uh, you know, I've been looking for years for somebody to talk sports with, and now I, you know, I found a bunch of people who uh, who love it as much as I do. So, thank Beautiful. you. Beautiful. Guest on some of these other shows too. Um, uh, we'll we'll have to arrange it um, tonight. Um, the house is full, but we're going to be talking or tomorrow night. We're going to have Gump Worsley's daughter on the Hal Box show. Wow. And um, Leanne is a Facebook friend, and um, I'm look, looking forward to that. We'll talk a little hockey. And um, um, I love what we're doing, and you're a big part of it. So thank you, Jack, on behalf of the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. Well, everybody have a good night, and uh, let's go Yankees. <laughs> and next week we'll come back with a real good spring training, um, a pre-spring training show. Um, we'll talk a little bit about who's coming up in the minors and who's going to take that next step. Um, and I look forward to that, Jack. Okay, Ralph, have a good night. Bye-bye now. Thank you for listening, everybody. The show is DeGraw's Yankees, and the network is the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. I'm Ralph Tycho, the weak link of it all. Adios. Thanks for listening. The proceeding was a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. Thank you for listening.